Hey, Robin. Hey, Pat. How are you? Yes. I got a new computer, so I'm like trying to figure it all out. <laughs> like, oh, the new shiny thing. Oh, I don't know how it works. <laughs> I know I hate I hate that when that happens or a new vehicle. You know, yeah. If, if if the dashboards were all the same, it would be just so much yeah. easier. Right, right, right. And if theoretically I should be able to attach my headphones, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take that leap right now. Hmm. Hattie, Nate. Hello, Hattie. Hi, Pat. Hi, Robin. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Couldn't be better. <laughs> is it really that color outside your windows, Pat? Looks very it pretty. is. It's beautiful. Oh, pretty. There was a gorgeous sky before. It's kind of one of those those um, religious kind of things where the light rays just came up behind the meadow trees. Gotcha. I, I yeah. wasn't in a position to grab my camera, but it was... It's in my mind, so that's all right. Yeah, sure. Is Nate with us or just Notice in spirit? Their name <laughs> so far. Well, you've got a lot of people attending. Hello. Hello, Michaela. Hey. I was looking for the Michaela. panelist invite like last time, but all I could find was the public invitation. Yeah, so I was like, well, yeah. they'll probably <laughs> yeah. see me and promote me. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> oh, boy. We wouldn't start without you, but um, <laughs> so this is 6.33, we have a quorum, it's being recorded. There's 11 members in the audience and I thought there'd be one more commission member present, but. Um... Yeah, we're like waiting for Antonia and or Madeline. I'm not, I don't know if Madeline will make it, but I thought Antonia yeah. was going to be here. Okay. Um well we still have to wait two minutes anyway, right? We do, yeah. We have to we should wait. Nate, I just sent you um two photos from uh before and after the fire of eighteen what did we say? Eighteen seventy-nine of the um the cutler mm -hmm. block. I think I, I have those online in the uh Okay. I, I scan about a half a dozen photos. Okay. Yeah. And do we have any pictures of the L? I was there today checking it out, but it didn't occur to me to take photos in real time. <clears throat> I tried Google Maps, but they didn't go down there. I think there is one, Robin, in the in the packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I might have missed it. Yeah, I took photos, and then I've um, so I'm trying to get them ready, but. Uh... Nate, there's a happy birthday showing up behind you. Is your birthday? <laughs> oh, is it my birthday? Yeah. What's oh, showing up behind me, actually? I don't even know what's my background. It's on where, where your arm is like this when you turn a little bit. There's like something that keeps popping up that says happy birthday on it. <laughs> oh, it's a bag. It's my daughter's birthday tonight. Oh, okay. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. <laughs> happy birthday to your that's daughter. Why I, that's why I have to leave early. Yeah. Um, so we can celebrate at like 8.30 at night. Okay. <laughs> How old is she, Nate? She's 12. All right. Well, she's just getting started at 830. <laughs> <laughs> we usually have a late night anyways. So yeah. Okay. Well, it's 635 by my clock. It is. So uh should I just go ahead and open the hearing and meeting and all that? Yep. Now I'll know if you know if another member or two <clears throat> for the commission shows up. Okay. Of course, I did switch out the preamble. There it is. Okay. I think I have this preamble right now. 
Um, so it is 6.35. Um, this is the October 12th, 2023 meeting of the Historical Commission. Um, per, and uh, the preamble, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law C-30A, Section 18, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 14th, 2022 and signed into law on July 16th, 2022, this public meeting and public hearings of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing has been posted on the town's online calendar. Um, and then to open, are we having one hearing or two, Nate? It's one hearing for two buildings? Sorry about that. That's okay. I was just in my phone so I get some pictures for the building. So it's two okay. separate hearings. Okay. Should we open them at the same time? Like we did before? Yeah, I think that'd be fine. We can um, you know, have separate motions, close them at different times. So it'd probably be helpful to open them at the same time because it is kind of the same project. Okay, so I will open both meetings. Um, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A and Article 3.60 of Amherst General Bylaws, Preservation of Historically Significant Buildings, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Amherst Historical Commission is holding these public hearings to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the following demolition application requests. 45 South Pleasant Street, uh, parcel 14A-250, Barry Roberts, request to demolish rear L portion of the brick building. And 55 South Pleasant Street, uh, parcel 14A-281, Barry Roberts, request to demolish a circa 1879 wooden building. Uh, so with the hearing open, do we move to a presentation by the... Applicants. Nate? Sure. If there's anyone here to represent the application, you could raise your hand. All right. I'll present you to panelists and might ask you that question. Thanks, Nate. I don't know if Barry's here too. You might yeah, want to. Yeah. Uh, He'll be coming him. over. Yeah, he may have some information about the structure that you want to hear. Oh, you know, hold on a minute. All right. Barry, I think if you unmute yourself, you're allowed to talk. Okay, now? Yep. Much better. Okay. So, Madam Chair, you know, um, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, here on behalf of and with Barry Roberts um for these two portion of one of the buildings and in, in the entirety of the other building um you know i know nate's got a lot of the photos and in history i don't know if he wants to go through that first i don't know if you want to um i don't know what you'd like to hear from us but you know we're obviously happy to have whatever discussion you want uh, I'll, I'll take one step back and say um if you don't know Barry, he's a he's a long time uh, Amherst resident, property owner, um, developer, a philanthropist. He has recently, and when I say recently, I'll probably in the last three years, moved three different structures. Um, one down to Snell Street, um, from further down South Pleasant Street, and then two from um, uh, Fearing Street, right at the corner of Fearing and Sunset. Uh, he moved two of those. One of those went to Hadley. That's the only place he could find. The other one went down uh, to 175 West Street in Amherst. So 
And he also saved rehab uh, what's now Amherst Cinema. So if there's an opportunity to save and to reuse, he does it. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we're going to be focusing on the removal of structures. And I'd like to just remind the commission that we are retaining that Hastings piece, right? That, that the separate building, because it's, and is separate from that L, but that entire facade of that Hastings building and that building is being reused. I mean, there's going to be retail space on that first floor. And then the idea is to have apartments above that. Um, and so where it, where it really makes sense, he'll do it. He's looked at preserving both the L and that um, uh, wooden clabbered building, the brown building. And just it, it doesn't make sense, you know, that wood building is not ADA compliant, um, where it sits in relation to the Hastings building wouldn't allow redevelopment, uh, redevelopment would, you know, you need sufficient area and walkways for accessibility, and that building is really right in the way. We've thought about preserving just the facade, but that frankly really doesn't get us, doesn't get anybody anywhere. Um, because again, that that accessibility and the accessible routes that would need to uh, occur in any future development condition, and so you know, I just want as Nate's presenting the photographs, and, and I mean, yeah, the building's been there, um, and it's been part of the streetscape. Um, we're happy. We've we've also listed it on Craigslist. You know, anticipating whatever this commission is going to do, if we can find somebody to remove it in whole or in part, at least it would be going somewhere um, and, and preserved that way. So we've tried to be thoughtful about it, but in, in this redevelopment, we just don't see a way to preserve either of these, the, the L portion of the Hastings building or that front building meaningfully. And while it's always sad to see the buildings go, that's just the evolution of things, if you will. And so, you know, we're happy to take photographs and memorialize it to the extent that we can and we, we really did give it a, a good effort to try to preserve it. So, you know, that's just more long-winded than I want it to be as an intro, but I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Nate to, or whatever the commission would like for us to answer. Before Nate goes forward, could you just speak a little bit more about the L and what uh, issues um, you're encountering there? Yeah, so that's a, it's a, it's a separate building. Um, it's... <laughs> It's an older separate building. I don't think it has the accessibility that we would need. You know, there's no elevator, there's no ramp, there's only stairs. Um, and it's just, it's not easily redeveloped, right? Uh, most recently, Barry did the center school in Hatfield, if you're familiar with that. If not, you should go over and take a look at it. He did a really phenomenal job, but the, the infrastructure, the structure was there, right? The infrastructure there, it, it made sense to do it. And I can tell you that if, if Barry could preserve the building and, and redo it, I mean, it's, it saves money. And not only is it beauty, beautiful, and there's a whole story to it, but it saves money because you're not taking it down. You got the infrastructure there. And so if he could, believe me, he would. And so, you know, I think with, with that L, that's the problem you're running into, plus the, the footprint that it occupies. And it's just the layout is just not really conducive to that internal redevelopment that you'd like to have. Nate, do you want to give staff comments? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to share my screen and then we'll look at some of the application um, images. We'll look at 45 South Pleasant first. So, you know, this is the L that's visible for everyone. Um, here's, you know, uh, from the, you know, this shows it clearly. This is when you're, you walk back down the alley and you're looking north. Uh, the Amherst Cinema building is a yellow brick on the left. <clears throat> so it is a separate building. There's a connector to the Hastings block. Um, you know, here's just another view. This is from actually the, uh, uh, the alley behind Bank of America in between the cinema. So this is all the way back, you know, with your, um, your back against actually um, South Pleasant Street. So you're looking, you're looking uh, west here. And so this is the Amherst Cinema building here in the yellow. This is the, the one side of it. Here's the 
I mean, this side, this side actually is visible from South Prospect Street. So this would be the, the west facing facade. And so, you know, that's the building. I think that, um, let's go to 55 South Pleasant as we're looking at it. Here's, it's a two story building in downtown. Here's a, a side view down the alley. Here's the back view. And here's again, the front. And so, you know, both of these buildings are, you know, deemed historically significant. So that's why we're here. And, you know, they're, they're mentioned in the national uh, business, national historic district nomination. Uh, this building in particular right here is one of the two older buildings, oldest buildings in downtown. It has changed shape and form over the years, but it has been a part of the streetscape for, you know, almost 200 years. Uh, the other building, although less visible, is visible from South Prospect Street, and it is it is also uh, an older structure. And so, you know, I'll, I'll walk through what were some historic photos, really just focusing on, on uh, 55. So, uh, my, yeah, let's go to the top. Sorry, I was out of order. Um, so here's the building. This is when it's Kendrick's Market. This is actually, um, it goes chronologically from earliest to oldest as we go down. So here it was, was a one-story building. Um, the only existing building remaining right now is, uh, is, is, uh, is this one from this picture. And here's 1879. Uh, here's the building. It's a pretty good view of it. Uh, here's, you know, this is what would be the Hastings building. And here's uh, two brick buildings that uh, this one is remaining. Again, here it is, it's changed shape a little bit. You know, it's lost uh, a portion on the left side if you're looking at it, the, the Southern side. You know, the gray change of South Pleasant has changed over time. So, you know, the, the road has been brought up. Uh, you know, there's been improvements to the common, but you know, here it is again here. And so this has been kind of a, a steady part of the streetscape. Here it is here. <laughs> this is this is into the 1880s. So this is the new building, right? The building we were just looking at actually burned down and this was what replaced it. Is that correct? Well, so I'm focusing on just the, the 55. So this is- Yeah, know. yeah, but that was my understanding that this building here in the picture that you just have, mm -hmm. that, the, that you can see that's got the Italianate roof the, and the windows are different. The, the previous building was lost in the fire or-, or so go back. I guess which built are you talking about this yeah. building? Yes, yeah. Yeah, right. So, but but the one that's proposed for demolition remains, right? So it's not. Oh, oh, okay. All right. So that remained. That's the, still the same building for, that survived the fire. Is that what we're saying? You know, it, the way the nomination and everything I can find is written, it it did. So okay. it says it's one of the few buildings that survived okay. the fire. Oh, okay. That, All right. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, you know, there's a like a half a dozen fires in the mid to late 19th century. And so they started building brick in the Civil War uh, and after, um, sometimes a little earlier, but, you know, here it is down here, still a single story building. Um, you know, here it is in the 1920s and here it's two story. And so, you know, what happened, you know, my guess is in the teens, it went to two story. And then Barry has mentioned that in the 70s, they changed the siding. I think that's when the roof changed. And so it was a flat roof building probably for most of its existence. And then it changed with the front pitch to what you see today. And so back in the seventies, there was a push to try to make things look a little different. I don't want to, you know, I was talking to Chris Bressler, the planning director. She's like, you know, almost Scandinavian, right. But like there was some aesthetic that they were uh, trying to achieve in a number of buildings around town. And so this is what it looks like today. So, you know, it's changed shape over time. Uh, it's formed, but it's been a presence on the street. Um, you know, and, and it's how it, I think in the narrative and the application is, you know, there's been local shops, um, you know, familiar names that have been associated with this. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's apparent. The other building, you know, although less visible is still, you know, ha has, as Tom mentioned, it's a, it's an older building. It has some really nice brickwork, some detail, uh, and it is a separate building from the Hastings building. So structurally, you know, they're connected by, uh, you know, by a structure, but they're not, they don't share the same foundation or a wall. Hmm. And, you know, I mean, that's, I guess I could keep going on, but I, you know, that's, that's it for okay. now. Um, 
Hetty and I were at uh, Special Collections today, just looking at the San the Sanborn maps and trying to get a little bit more of a sense of the history of that L um, and also the buildings together. Um, it looks like the L has pretty consistently been related to a building that's related to the the Hastings building as you know part of that. I mean, it was a market and a dry grocer and then storage. Um, so that's information that we have. Um, should we move into questions from commissioners, Nate? Is that where we're at? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Antonia? Um, I have a clarification question. So for 45 Pleasant Street, um, when was that, like, when was that done? It was in the 19, was that in the 1920s? Like that was, that replaced the one before or late 1890? I, I, I don't think I was fully clear about that. So 45 on the Macris record, I think it says circa 1879 because they don't yeah. have dates before the fire. Is that essentially? Mm -hmm. Right. So, but, but those photos, we know the photos that you have are at least prior to the fire because the previous building is existent in them. So we're looking at what circa 1800 for the smaller building or even further back. No, I mean, I, you know, it's, um, there were some earlier photographs and it wasn't present. So, I mean, it's like, you know, early to mid uh, 19th century. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, it's hard because a lot of things are undated. Uh, right. There's no, there's not, there's not a lot of records that would pinpoint out an exact date. Right. But pre 1879 for sure. Yes. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I, I have a question. I, my hand is up. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, that, that's all right. There was mention of uh, advertising to have the 55 moved. And I, I'm just curious whether there's a, a structural engineering report that would support that or not. Um, and and aside from Craigslist, is there a, a, any other effort to try to get someone to repurpose, to move, to repurpose the uh, features of the building? So if I could, Madam Chair, um, <clears throat> I'll start with the second piece first. Uh, we've actually got some great responses on Craigslist, actually. Folks who are really interested um, because it's, you know, we want to be respectful of the commission process. We don't want to tell people, here's the date, come and get it, right? Obviously. So it's been really high level, but there's been, I'd say, six to 10 um, inquisitions of, can you tell us a little bit more? Do you have a timeline for it? Can we take it apart piecemeal? You know, I, I've been in the building. I don't... Um, I mean, it's got somewhat of a cobble basement. There's, it's like a six foot six in the bit. I, I, I would find it hard for somebody to pick it up and actually move it somewhere, to be honest with you. You look at one of the photos that Nate had from to, you know, today, it's, it's got that fake peak on the top. Um, and in, on the interior, you know, there's probably some good um, old wood, old, old beams are probably in there. But you're, I, I would find it hard for somebody to just pick up the whole thing and look to relocate it that way. It seems more like a disassembly and then either using portions or probably the, the best that could be done. If you go inside, there are stairs, which don't, I mean, they're not to code. You've got risers that are, you know, maybe lopsided one way. I mean, it, in its latest iteration, it was a, a hair salon. Um, I mean, Caymans had been in there. You, you go in there and it's just, I think Barry's words was functionally obsolete. So, I, I, you know, Pat, I don't expect somebody to come in and to move the whole thing. It's probably more like disassemble and reuse. We had somebody ask for for the clabbers for a, a neighbor's barn because they thought it would be a good reuse because they're older, um, you know, that type. But we have got, in, to answer the question, I don't know if we can look if if the commission's interested in, in other avenues to get somebody to do it. That's completely fine. Um, but we've got a pretty good response on Craigslist, and I think we could find someone there to at least take the parts and purposefully reuse them. 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make some comments on 45. Um, it looks to me, and I'd be happy to ha hear other people's input, like the one thing that it suggests in that streetscape, it reminds me of um, the Amherst typewriter building that we also looked at, um, you know, what a time when Amherst had a much lower st structural height. And so when you look at the building itself, the height says, oh, this is kind of from an earlier time, you know, we weren't building up high at that point. At the same time, um, I'd be, cu I'm curious, I'm guessing that to me, it looks like if we're talking about an issue of preferable, excuse me, preferably preserved, um, it's really lost a lot of its physical integrity other than its height and the scale on the, on the streetscape. Um, it doesn't seem to have a lot that still tells the story of what it was before. And um, I just wanted to put that out there. I mean, I would use that as an argument to weigh against this particular preservation of this particular building because I'm not convinced there's enough there um, of the historic fabric to really meet that integrity um, level. And, and I would also add that um, I wouldn't be as concerned about it not being able to be moved because I think uh, a building of that type in terms of being a commercial building, when you move it out of a, a commercial streetscape like ours, uh, again, its setting um, tells a lot about its um, historical use. And so th th there wouldn't be, you know, I'm, I'm very in favor of the reuse of materials, but I'm not as concerned about this particular building um, being relocated uh, in order to preserve it for a lot of the same reasons. Oh, Hedy, you have your hand up, I'm sorry. Hmm. I was just curious, um, based on the photographs that Nate was showing us, um, that the, the building when it was one story high had a, a series of raised steps up to the doorway and that seems sort of still to be there. Am I right? You know, that you, in order to enter what was the Red Door Salon, you would go up some steps to the door and then in and to the sort of window on the, what would be the left-hand side. Um, so it seems that they've, that that's kind of been a, a, a kind of continuity through the changes in the building. And it, it really feels like a sort of groovy, funky, vernacular structure. It's it's very anomalous in a way um, to much of downtown Amherst. It is a bit like the typewriter building, um, and and it speaks to a kind of diversity that um, doesn't really um, strike you when you look at the sort of overall commercial brick Victorian structures that are so handsome. You know, you've got this little funky thing kind of sticking there. Um, and having been inside the building and through the fretted instrument um, shop, you can actually see where the two buildings join at the back. And it's pretty funky. I mean, they've missed it by six inches. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know who built this building. <laughs> But you know, it it wasn't it wasn't anybody who with skilled joinery skills or you know it's 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 very very workaday in quality, um, which kind of is intriguing, you know, to have a building like that in the downtown. I'm I'm sure when you walk through it, Tom, that it didn't feel very much like anything. Um, but in a way, that's what makes it intriguing to me as a historian. Um, just as the typewriter building, you know, has a really interesting history in terms of who's been selling typewriters out of there, you know, for, for Amherst's history. Um, and so, you know, it, I'm, I'm curious about stuff that is, uh, what I want to ask you about is actually stuff that doesn't sort of relate to the, hearing, which is sort of how the building, how the demolition process will influence what kind of a structure you're making with those two spaces. But 
I, I, I have every faith in Barry because he knows that area so well um, that, that that will be considered very carefully. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that about the steps that you can see at the front of the building at 45. Thank you, Hattie. Pat, Michaela, do you have any comments or questions? Um, I'm not sure about like the historical relevance of it, but I just wanted to know about the mural on 45. Is there any consideration given to that? It's also pretty funky and cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I think the mural is on 55. Is that right? Do I have that right? On the back of 45. Oh, back of 45. Okay. Yeah, right. the, the, um... I've got them mixed up. I apologize. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, it is pretty funky. So it was done by an artist that had worked at Hastings. Hastings kind of allowed him to do it. Uh, took several years, um, but the folks at Hastings had had a conversation and, you know, the artist understands the ethereal and uh, temporary nature of street art. And so was fine with it coming down. You know, I think we'd like to, I don't see on a, a future condition here, if the redevelopment happens for that, uh, for a mural to, to appear, but we're going to try to find another space to allow that artist to, you know, represent themselves. So it's, it's, it's that sort of thought um, that way. So on building 55, so this is the shorter in stature. Brown building. Um, uh, Nate, oh, and Nate, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I should have called on you. Um, did we have an answer to my question about the, the none of the exterior is original at this point, right? No, I was gonna say that during the hearing, I was just looking at the nomination form and the inventory form and, it's, and so it, it both claim that it was rebuilt after the fire of 78. Um, but they say it was built to have the likeness of what was there before. And so um, it's really hard to determine, you know, is this a 79 structure or is this part of the earlier structure, right? So there's no really records that indicate that. So, you know, what looked like a stucco wall or, a, you know, some wall maybe under the current siding, but it looked like, you know, from the twenties picture that it maybe had been, uh, could have had brick on it. Um, <laughs> You know, so it's, oh. you know, I think the material, the outward facing material, the kind of facade treatment has changed over time. Yeah, I mean, that looks pretty contemporary at this point. It doesn't really, uh, like, I, like, I mean, what, what I was saying before is that it reads to me as the size looks historic, but the rest of it, um, I mean, the window openings, I guess, but I'm not even sure about, about that part of it. Um, does anybody have, and I apologize for mixing up the numbers, does anybody have, have any other questions or comments about 55, uh, the smaller of the two buildings on top? Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen again. So here here it is right in the 20s as a two-story. Uh, it's right okay. here that's visible. Uh, and as a one-story, uh, let me just, sorry, scroll up one more. Um, you know, here's a good image of it. And this would have been the rebuilt version if this is accurate uh, after 78 so okay and it looks nothing like either of them now <laughs> it looks like that this today i mean they they kept kind of the uh the step back entry here there was the the asymmetric facade uh, an overhanging <clears throat> second floor they they kept that um you know if we so Pardon all the scrolling, but if you look here, I mean, it looks like a three window, three windows across, um, you know, there's four. It's really hard to say, you know, what's happened over time, right? I mean, I think they've, you know, they've, you know, they, it was, you know, it was modified over time, right? It, as needed, things changed and added to it. Uh, and it's, you know, so it's probably been, you know, I, I think it's probably looked like this for the last 50 or 60 years, maybe. Right. Any other comments on that building? Okay. Um, 
So the brick building, which we're referring to as an L, which is sort of not an L because it's sort of its own structure. Um, questions or comments from commission members? And that's 45, uh, 45 the rear building. 45, yeah. yeah, I'm sharing the screen right now just so you, you can see that again. Um, and if anybody has raised their hand. Yep. Now. Um, do you have a photo of the front facade now um, of it? Well, this, I mean, this is, you know, so there's really no front, right? It's behind yeah, the exactly. building. And then um, you can see it, I don't know, you know, if you're standing right at the edge of the Bank of America parking lot, you look behind Amherst Cinema. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. You, you see, what you see is that you see this uh, in the distance. Yeah. And so, you Got know. Got it, right, the difference. Right. Got it. Great. Yeah, and if, you, if you're standing by Laughing Dog Bicycles, you see the other view. Yeah, you see this. Like that is the front because that seems to be where things got loaded in and out. It's a little hard to see with the dumpster in the way, but there's a pretty significant door there. And there's, you know, that. Um, yeah, I was, I'd email myself some pictures, but they're not coming through. So I was hoping. Yeah, okay. I could... But the, um, yeah, that um, that central area on the left portion of the building with the lintel over top, like that looks like that was some sort of loading door. It's bricked over now, but to the left. Yeah, right here. Yeah, yep. Well, I mean, I will offer that uh, this building speaks to me a lot more in terms of its retaining its integrity for its original purpose. Um, it looks from the Sandbar maps like it's been pretty pretty consistently associated with those market buildings with the dry grocer and, um, and 55 as well. Um, and I, I absolutely appreciate uh, the comments about efforts to, the challenge of efforts to um, rehabilitate and um, particularly in terms of accessibility. Um, but I have a harder time, uh, I have a harder time with this one from my uh, non-builders, but historic preservation perspective, <laughs> um, wondering what might be achievable um, and whether this meets um, the commission's bar for prefer preferably preserved. Um, it is a space that you, when you go into that space and you have Laughing Dog, I mean, that's an old old historic building back there. There's, you know, there's a sense of history going on in that, in that area. Um, and um, I'm leaning in a different direction on this particular building, but um, this is where it gets challenging um, considering uh, considering the um, putting a, a demolition delay on to see if if there are other avenues for um, repurposing that that really would be feasible. I, it's not I, I, I'm not taking that lightly. <laughs> so yeah, I was gonna say that the you know here's um, here's 55. And then here's 45 right here. And this is the 1887 Sanborn maps. And so it, you know, er, the, there's probably um, six or seven series of Sanborn maps up through the 1930s, you know, and the, you know, these are always present, the labeling may change, um, but, you know, right, they're pretty consistently shown. And this was the Kellogg, when the building is rebuilt, it's the Kellogg and, I don't remember. It's, it's colored. Yeah, yeah. Um, business. You can see it right there. Mate, on the Mate, can you enlarge that at all for us? Yeah, let me just. Um... Cool. Great. Ooh. Is that is that better or? Yeah, that's wonderful. So you can see Laughing Dog and the little. Tin Smith on the back, which is appears to be dark in every every map that I looked at, and you can see the the back L, mm -hmm. which is really two sections in in the eighteen eighty seven Sanborn, um, and I think at one point I noticed it had a some kind of um, heat source because of course Sanborn would have been really interested in that. 
in that in that space. Um, yeah, I, I I I walked I walked with um, Tony, who owns Fretted Instrument, you know, through his his whole space there, and uh, it's pretty cool in the back. Um, there's a um, workshop space that he uses to repair musical instruments that has a barrel vault ceiling. Acoustics are fantastic. Um, so there's some question about whether that was a performance space at some point. I've, I've um, got some correspondence with a, a butter that, that suggests that might have been a, a place called Sweetser Hall. Um, it's difficult to confirm all of that at the moment. Um, I took a photograph and, you know, heard about it from people who've been um, in that area for a long time. So there's, there's a sort of a, a strand of oral history evidence that I'm trying to respect at this point um, in the process. And I'd like to know more about that and like to kind of track some of that stuff down. Uh, if possible. And so like Robin, I, I feel this building is a little bit more complicated. Thanks, Nate, if I, well, if I if I could, maybe just uh, what you showed on those Sanborn maps, and I don't know if you have a current aerial, like if you pull up Amherst maps or something, just to compare the two because they appear different. Um, you'll notice today that there's this different back piece on it. So just to compare them side by side. Um, and then, the, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just to jump in, I, I, we, Hattie and I, I don't have them in front of me, but Hattie and I looked at the succession of the maps. It does change a little bit. I think right. that footprint um, might show up in a later map. So um, yeah, so here's, here's the current um, structure now. Is that visible for everyone? Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I was just jumping around on the Sanborn maps. Here is the um, uh, 1896 Sanborn map. So it says, you know, now this is, uh, it has you know, labeled meat for 55. Here's uh, 45. It still has what, you know, still similar to um, 1887, you know, a little change in stairs. Um, and I can, you know, I can go back through the directory if we want, no, we're I'll try. With the 1910, yeah. yeah. Show it. Oh, and I forget which one it is on this one. Let me just see which one it comes up as. I was told that the stairs got added so that people could go into this performance space without going into the rest of the building. They could just walk down the alley, as it were, and up some stairs um and there is still a there is still yeah. material evidence of that um in that back space um that's used as a workshop so here it here it is now i think in its current form so a little bit more similar yeah. yeah and i and i think maybe madam chair one of the other things to consider is the proximity of this building to the property line um and just what that means for meaningful redevelopment, uh, plus the size of the space that exists currently, um, and what would have to be done to bring it up to today's code. And I don't know, if, Barry, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, because I'm definitely not a builder, just what, what that entails. Because if we're talking about, right, so if you're going to put a one-year delay on and say it's preferably preserved, it, it should be something for a purpose to say, can something happen there? And I'm just not, like I said in the intro, I'm just not convinced that it can. Um, so Barry, I don't know if you want to talk at all about the structure and what it would mean to redevelop it. I guess I could say that um, the problem with it being so close to the property line is being able to get windows. Uh, I mean, there is some windows there, but to... Uh, do what we're proposing to do. Uh, the windows probably don't line up anywhere near and the floor levels don't line up now with the interior of 
the Hastings building. There's stairs that go everywhere. And I don't know how you correct that uh, and make them, you know, put ramps in and all that to make them, because uh, we want to use the new building that we propose to build in conjunction with the pump building. And they don't line up now at all. Okay, thank you. Well, this is where um, and we have um, two pretty new commissioners here. And um, I, I mean, even I feel like this gets challenging because our directive, and I'm just looking at our bylaw, is to um, give a de designation of preferably preserved if, if uh, a demolition authorization would represent a loss to the Amherst community. And we're not kind of given, we're not really, we're, we're not giving power to make those decisions be, because we're not builders. We're, we're here to kind of vote for the building. <laughs> and at the same time, you know, really understand where you're coming from. And so the, the one of the advantages of the fact that there's demolition delay is that eventually, um, you know, if nothing's possible, it, a delay will expire and development can go on. So I'm just trying to give um, myself <laughs> and my commissioners a sense of, you know, what our charge is here in terms of deciding on this building and, you know, everybody could have their own opinions, but, um, but what, what we're not deciding about is whether we think it's, you know, if we, if we lack the technical, technical know-how to understand how feasible it is to redevelopment, if, and whether or not we do think it would be valuable to give time to explore that option further, I think maybe that's a good way of saying it. Is that, is that, Nate, am I being clear? <laughs> is that helpful? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the idea of a demolition is it's, you know, more due diligence time. So whether it's documentation, research, uh, possible reuse, you know, I mean, <clears throat> right in the spectrum of preservation, it would be, you know, preserving it on site, maybe reusing it, moving it, and then, you know, you know, down to saving salvaging parts. But I think, um, you know, it begins with some, a little bit more research and documentation. And so, you know, Hetty's brought up a few, um, you know, interesting facts that, right, it's through the research that I've done, you know, it's something that isn't, a, you know, it's not, it doesn't, it's not described very well. And so even on the inventory forms for these buildings, they're just like, yeah, they're historic. You know, there were some fires in Amherst and they were rebuilt and, uh, and they've been here since, you know, for 140, 50 years. And so, and because of that, you know, and some, and, and also because it was some of the, you know, same families, there just wasn't a lot of, if it, the buildings in the properties didn't change hands a lot, there's not a lot of deed research that can be done, right? So if this stayed with Caymans and Kendrick and certain families for a hundred years, then there's really not a lot of documentation about what's happening there. Um, we don't have any permit records that go back that far. I mean, we can chase it through uh, some vital records that are available through the clerk's office and everything, but that takes some time. I mean, that, that's going to take some, you know, some more research. And so to me, a delay would allow that research. You know, the bylaw also allows for lifting of a delay if a bona fide effort has been made to seek, an, you know, a different solution than demolition. And so um, we provide that for an applicant. Yeah, so the applicant can come back at any time when they feel they've thoroughly exhausted their efforts. Is that correct, Nate? Right, right, yep. Yeah. So even if you had a 12-month delay imposed, um, the applicant could come back and conceivably the Historic Commission could lift the delay if they felt uh, due diligence had, had been done. Right, and it could be that, you know, Pat's asked about an engineering report for um, you know, 55, the building on the street. And so, you know, is there an engineering report? Is there, uh, you know, quotes from contractors in terms of the viability of salvaging or moving or whatever options there are available? And so, you know, the, those are the efforts that would be presented back at the commission. Okay. And that's helpful, just if I, if I could, before Antonio jumps in. Uh, I mean, because I was going to say, you know, sure, you can do all the research in the world, but to what end if it's just not going to be viable? Um, and because I think from from our perspective, it just isn't, and it's maybe just a matter of proving it. And, and if it is by 
I mean, we've looked at it and like I started with the intro, if it would be, we would be having a different conversation here. Um, but it's helpful to hear what sort of things the commission would be looking for in order to provide additional evidence that here are the impediments to redeveloping this. Um, and I wonder if the commission would, I mean, it won't take frankly, very long to pull those things together because they've already, we've already done it, right? We've already thought about it. We've already said, what are the, we've had architects in there. We've had the structural engineer in there. We've looked at reuse of the property. How Barry mentioned they don't line up in, you know, we can document that. I don't know if the commission would uh, entertain a shorter delay. I mean, we, or we can be back in a certain period of time. If you're going to impose a delay, we'd say start it now, just so that time starts going. But I think, I mean, for us, that's the way we're, thinking about. Okay. Um, so for the sake of time, does anybody have any other questions or comments substantive wise? Uh, if not, we could move on to the point of making a motion for each of these properties. So, but I think we need to have some public comment too, right? Right. Okay. Antonia sells her hand up. And I'm sorry, Antonia, feel free to speak no, up. I'm not no worries. Sure to um, hands today. Um, I was wondering, um, this is questions for you. So we have, our options are to either delay, approve, or is there another option? Uh, um, so, sometimes we have, um, we, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nate, we move uh, the issue to the next meeting to give more time for research. But I think what we're talking about is doing that kind of research if we were to impose a delay, okay. so. Right, the commission could continue the hearing to a date certain, you know, a month from now to allow for more information, or if we feel that there is, you know, enough information to make a decision, it could be made tonight. Um, so there's, you know, you could continue, you can, you know, allow demolition, you could uh, impose a delay. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay, then um, we should go to public comment. Yeah, there's 11 attendees still. If anyone wants to speak, you can uh, raise your hand. <clears throat> I didn't receive, I, you know, I received a few phone calls and some questions, but I haven't actually received many, much in the way of comments. Uh, you know, there was a few articles in the paper, uh, but I haven't received any anything. And so I'm not seeing any hands raised. We could ask one more time. Okay. One more time, if there are any members of the public who wish to speak on demolition permits before us on 55 and 45 South Pleasant Street. No, I don't see any hands being raised. Okay. Ah, there is one. Hi, Sharon, you can unmute yourself. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, I was, thank you for um, all of your thoughts and considerations. I, my, my name is Sharon Povinelli. Mary and I are the owners of the Mercantile 45 South Pleasant Street and appreciate your thoughtful, um, thoughtfulness about these buildings, both of these buildings. Um, I myself have, gone to work there for 30, 30 plus years. And um, if anybody uh, has, has feelings about those buildings, uh, certainly I do. And to Tom's point, you know, um, as we discussed how to preserve as much as possible um, that area of of, of town, that area of my life and Mary's life, um, you know, it was, it was pretty, um, it was pretty gut-wrenching to have to consider, um, taking down the L. Um, and I know that your commission, as you stated, your charge is not to figure out whether things are, uh, viable one way or another, you're, you're speaking for the building. And I can tell you that <laughs> there's a big part of me that, that speaks to that building and is, you know, um, 
I would be the first one in line if there was a way to preserve that and um, still preserve the front the front portion of the building. I would be right in that line. Um, it, it's just you know, I just wanted to make those those thoughts and just I appreciate what you're how you're thinking about it. And I just want to let you know, as as Tom has said, you know, we'd be happy to provide every anything you want. Um, yeah, that what we've done to figure out um, how to preserve as much of that as possible, the streetscape as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see no other hands raised at this point. So we will close public comment. And um, we have the issue of both um, demolition applications before us. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, make a motion. And I believe that um, the procedure is motion second discussion vote. Um, I'm gonna make a motion to allow the demolition permit for 55 South Pleasant Street. And um, that's based on my feeling that the integrity of the building uh, doesn't meet the standard for it to be a significant loss for the community. So the motion is to allow demolition uh, for 55 South Pleasant. And Michaela, you're yeah. raising your hand? Yeah, I'll second the motion to approve yes. the demolition okay. of 55 South Pleasant Street. So we have a second. Um, do we have further discussion? Feel free to raise your hand or just go ahead and speak. We're a pretty small group today. Nate, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was going to just, you know, throw out there that uh, it is a, a two-story facade along the street. And so I think that whether or not the, the you know, the treatment of the facade has changed, the presence of the building along the street has been there. And so, you know, there will be a loss, a visual loss along South Pleasant Street where, you know, there's a pretty consistent setback. Buildings are, you know, cheek and jowl with each other. And so, you know, I, I you know, I, I think that's a, a is going to be a, an impact on the street to lose that. So, you know, I, you know, buildings can change and this one has, um, you know, we, we saw the picture. So it's three different, possibly four different, um, you know, styles and facades treatments over, you know, the last hundred and 50 plus years, but it's been a, you know, it has been a consistent um, streetscape element. So that's you know, just something I want the commission to consider. Antonia? Um, I guess going off of um, Nat's point, um, I would say I would move for a delay on this um, on 55 due to the fact that I think there is a significant loss on despite the building's change um, throughout the last 150 years it has maintained this unique scale that I don't think should be minimized as like only the scale as it's one of the, probably the only building on that streetscape that is like is integral to Amherst Towns. Like when you enter, that's what you see and what is like the advertisement for the town um, and is one of the only ties we have to a time when those buildings were low and I think that has a large impact on what the community is going to see from the common, from even city hall, um, looking on that um, South Pleasant Street. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'm pretty much of the same mind as Nate's point and Antonia's that um, I I think that a delay would allow an opportunity to either move or repurpose the building, it will change the streetscape from, you know, 100, what did you say, 150 years or so. And so I'm, I'm not opposed to a vision for the future, but I, I would like that building documented more fully and, and his, his, its history document for the, for the mass historical um, commission before it, it would be demolished. Thank you. Heather or Michaela, discussion points, no? All right, so we have a motion before us 
to allow for uh, the demolition. I would say the only other comment I have is that we did um, allow for the demolition of a similar small building uh, for Amherst uh, typewriters of that building area. So uh, for similar reasons, but um, it sounds like we're ready for a vote. So the motion is to uh, allow the demolition permit. If the motion fails, I'm assuming we would look for a second motion to approve it or do, was that what happens? <laughs> I think we had a motion fail in my time before. <laughs> yeah, if the motion fails, it can, you know, there can be another motion made. Okay. All right. So um, I will go ahead and uh, do a roll call vote. Uh, so the motion is to allow for the demolition of 55 uh, South Pleasant Street. Um, I am an I vote. Uh, Pat, I'm sorry. Pat, did you have another comment? Your hand is up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't put it down from before. That's okay. Um, okay. so. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm I'm going to say no. Okay. Uh, Michaela. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Antonia. Um, no. Okay. And Hetty. Unmute, my dear. <laughs> Hetty. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm a no. Okay. So the motion fails. So do we have a motion to uh? Impose a demolition delay and uh, what time period if uh, such motion is coming before us? I'm Maybe. very amenable to what Tom said about, you know, does it have to be the full delay as per the bylaw? I mean, maybe we don't have to stick with it that. Doesn't. We can pick a doesn't time like, period, it can be up to 12 okay. months. Yeah, so I, know, I knew you would know. <laughs> if you want to make a motion, um, I, I'm not sure what a good time period would be. Um, also with the caveat that um, the applicant can come back, even if we impose six months, they can come back at any time and request um, the lifting of the delay. So I, I have my hand up, Robin. Um, yep. I, I would like to, to have a motion that um, there would be research, that there would be documentation, that there would be continued efforts to salvage so some of the building or move it, which the moving doesn't sound very feasible, but but just to, to have a delay so that um, the developer can come back to us with that information and, and more information filed with the Mass Historical Commission about the building. I think generally, um... I'm just trying to think this through here. Generally, when we um, allow a demolition, we put um, a condition on it. I don't. I think if we we're going to put a delay on that, somewhat puts the onus on us to do research. Is that true, Nate? I think it's a little both. If the applicant would like to have the delay lifted, they would do the research that you know Pat mentioned that's been discussed. So okay. I think it's yeah. you know they're you know they're here tonight. You know Tom and Barry are here and they're listening. So I'm I'm you know I don't I don't necessarily necessarily I think we need to condition a uh, delay motion I think it's just you know that's that would be the bona fide effort to try to get it um lifted earlier than what what would be could be voted okay if I could uh, madam chair just one thing so I mean we've been listing on Craigslist for about a month and so like I said I don't think anybody's going to lift the whole thing and, and move it and people are asking about when it can happen and so if there is a directive to us to provide additional information, I don't think that would take, you know, photographs. We, we can do all of that, but we'd like to, if there is some preservation of the materials, we'd like to be able to give people while they're kind of on the line, um, the ability to say, okay, at, at this day, it will be available. And then we can figure out who's real, who's just coming out of nowhere and just to rabble rouse. So, you know, if that's 30 days, 60 days, you know, something like that. I think it's not a very hard turnaround. There's a lot of information that was provided, I know, and we can provide some more. I think most of it has been provided. So that's kind of two cents. Thank you. Um, Nate, what, can I just ask your recommendation? Do you think three months would be reasonable, two months? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go any shorter than three months. Okay. I mean, we say it doesn't take a long time, but if, you know, if someone's busy for a few weeks and we, we'd like to get a written report or, you know, I just, okay. I don't want to, you know, they can always come back sooner than that. Right. So, okay. I mean, we could say six months and then, you know, they could come back in three and that, and it could be lifted. It's just, you okay. know, I wouldn't shortchange this to 
you know, yep. just because I, I, I mean, things always seem to take longer. Yep, I hear what you're saying. All right, um, in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion again. <laughs> I'm gonna make a motion to uh, uh, impose a demolition delay of six months. And I need a second. I second it. Second. Okay, so Antonia has seconded. Uh, any discussion for this motion? Uh, this is 55 South Pleasant Street, demolition delay period of six months. Uh, during that time, the applicant can return to us and ask that the delay be lifted if uh, we feel we've uh, exhausted the possibilities and uh, obtained the research that we need. And so the clarification would be that we're, we're doing a delay of six months to give the applicant time to return to us, but they could return to us at any point within That's that right. six months. Okay, so um, any other discussion? We can go to a vote. Okay, so we're gonna have a roll call vote again. I'll start with Michaela. The motion before us is uh, to impose a six month demolition delay on 55 South Pleasant Street. Yes. Okay, uh, Hetty? Yes. Uh, Antonio? Yes. Pat? Yes. And I will vote yes. So that motion passes 5 0. Uh, delay imposed six months on 55 South Pleasant Street with the ability of the applicant to return to the Historic Commission uh, for a request to list the delay. Okay. Um, do we need to close that hearing, Nate? Oh, you're Nate, you muted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can have a motion to close the hearing or if they're open simultaneously, you could see what happens with the other, um, you know, the other building. Okay, I'll just keep it open for now. I'm mindful of the time and the fact that I lose Nate at eight o'clock. <laughs> He's my lifeline, so. Um, okay, so uh, 45, South Pleasant Street, um, and we have entertained public comment for both buildings since both hearings are open. Um, does anybody else have any further discussion or want to put forward a motion for the demolition application for 45 South Pleasant Street, the L at the rear of the building? Someone be brave. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to put forward a motion then, uh, to um, uh, issue a six month uh, delay on this building as well. Same, same situation as for 55 South Pleasant Street. Six month demolition delay for 45, the, at the uh, rear L of 45 South Pleasant Street uh, with the ability for the applicant to return uh, to request a lifting of the delay. Do I have a second? I second. second. At seconds. Is there any further discussion? Okay, then we'll go toward a roll call vote. Uh, I will start with Antonio voting for a six month demolition delay on 55 or 45 South Pleasant. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye, aye. Okay, Hetty? Yes. Uh, Michaela? Yes. Pat? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that motion passes 5-0. Okay. Um, at this point, can we close the public hearing? We need a motion to do that. Okay, somebody give me okay. a motion. Okay, so move. Moved. You have a second? I'll second. second. Okay. Uh, and uh, vote, I vote I to close the public hearing, both public hearings, Pat. Aye. Michaela? Aye. Antonia? Aye. Okay. Aye. So the public hearings for both properties are closed as of 7.39 p.m. Thank you to the applicants for uh, entertaining us with your information. And um, I assume, Nate, Nate, do you have any more comments regarding no, no, I mean, I think, you know, we can be in touch. I think, um, you know, it's, you know, if we'd like to do a site visit, we can coordinate that uh, if we want to do any more research. Um, yeah, I think that's something that we, you know, in the next few months, we, you know, the commission as well as the applicant can undertake that. Okay, great. 
Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So moving on um, to the public meeting portion of our meeting. Uh, announcements is the next item on the agenda. Nate, do you have any announcements? No, I, I, I will say, right, I have to leave around eight o'clock. Um, we are meeting next week to just continue the discussion of the Jones Library uh, and the relation, you know, shift to the preservation restriction. And so I've asked for some updated information. I've yet to receive it, but, you know, that is um, a week from tonight. And, um, you know, it'll, it could be noted later in the agenda, but I just wanted to remind everyone now that, you know, next Thursday we will meet with the Jones Library. It's the only topic on the agenda uh, in part because there's a lot happening with the site and a lot to review uh, in terms of the preservation restrictions. So, you know, it, nothing, you know, the packet from last month will be, it's the same unless I get new information, I'll, I'll get that back online and share it, but you can always review it. And if you have questions, let me know in the next week. Okay. Um, I just want to let everybody know that next week I'm going to start working a new job with the Massachusetts Historical Commission. So it um, doesn't uh, affect my position on the commission other than I may have to recuse myself here and there depending on what comes before the commission. But that's my update. Anyone else Congrats. have any announcements? Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, no other announcements. Um, we can move on to our next uh, agenda item, which is the update and discussion of the preservation plan and the presentation by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. I know that Shannon is in the audience. And then Ken as well. Ken, I'm gonna, um, okay. uh, one second. Ken, I was gonna promote you to panelists as well. Right now I'm having a little trouble doing that. Hi, Shannon. Hi, and Ken Comia should be. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, I my um, yeah, it was slow. I don't know. My computer's been really slow lately. I'm not sure what's happening. Hi, Ken. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. <laughs> nice to see you guys. <laughs> Good to see you all too. It was very interesting listening to the um the hearing. Yeah, we, Shannon and I were texting back and forth, and I said, I've never been through a, a public hearing of this nature, so it was kind of neat to see it in action. It was really civil tonight, so that was a, it was a good oh, That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sorry that I got you the draft. I was hoping to get it by Friday, but as I we got a little breathing space with the end date for this. I started adding more things and then it was hard to stop. So um, I, what I had emailed to Nate, maybe he forwarded you the body of the email, but um, related to this draft, we wanted you to see some of the things that we added and look at the formatting and see if it makes sense. And it's easy to read the way that we've started to set it up. Um, just basically, get your comments on what we have so far. We put in some of the action steps and, and just started adding some of that. So if there's anything that you see that you say that doesn't make sense, or if you feel like there's anything missing, um, this would be great for you to share that with us now. I'm ready with my open word document to take notes. And happy birthday to your daughter, Nate. <laughs> um, I will say that it, it, what a phenomenally large document. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I put like the, the plans, um, we could move, we could move some things to the appendices. So, it, so it won't be so wordy. So anything I wanted you to see it all, but if there's things that we need to shift and we'll have an executive summary, one page, when we had talked early on, Nate had said, could this be something that could be pulled out as a standalone document? Um, so we'll streamline things as we get towards the finish line. So that would, one of my first questions was, as I was dealing it as a um, as PDF, um, I was wondering if, um, if it would be possible for me to get a Word version 
and do a, a track changes and a word version. Um, that might yep, be more I could do a Dropbox file. Efficient. Yeah, um, oh, then sure. trying to get a gazillion comments um, over a Zoom meeting. Um, but one of the things that I did want to add was one of our accomplishments uh, is that we do uh, have our barn and outbuilding um, program funded. We haven't um, distributed any funds yet, um, but, um, but we got CPA to approve, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was $10,000 for um, assessments for barns and outbuildings in the accomplishment column. <laughs> Noted, that's great. Yeah, and I, I, Robin, I just wanted to add that I would appreciate tracking changes. Okay, sure. Thank you. It was very hard for me to send it to you with it not being finished, <laughs> but yes, absolutely. So I think, yeah, we could set up, um, we're not, we're, we, we can't use Dropbox from a town account. Okay. Uh, because of some security issues. So I can set up like a OneDrive, you know, and we sure. can share it that way or something. But that sounds good. Yeah. I mean, yes. I like, yeah, I was surprised when I saw it. I was like, oh man, it, you know, it was longer than it was a while ago. But um, <laughs> I do like the format and the flow. So um, I think it reads well. You know, the previous plan, I don't know, something about it seemed, it seemed more dense, even if it was the length is similar. It's something about how it was structured, you know, visually or something. Um, I feel like this can be kind of a quicker read and, yeah. you know, I think for the commission, I mean, some of it is, you know, looking at the action steps and, you know, we had a, we had talked about what was, you know, Ben in my position said, well, you know, what are parts of Amherst that could be explored that weren't really researched well before and what really are, you know, concrete action steps that can be taken, you know, there's short-term, long-term goals, but I think, you know, what's nice is having that because, um, you know, the pres preservation plan before, to me, felt like it was uh, great capturing the history of Amherst, and then it had kind of broader things a commission can do, but not having it specific to Amherst. And so the commission was left saying, okay, well, what does it mean to do this, right? So how do we implement local historic districts as a preservation tool? And it's like, okay, well, you know, we're doing that now, but, you know, it took actually more research to then say, how do we get that going in Amherst? And so, you know, the idea here would be, let's have this be something that um, speaks to, you know, actionable items in, you know, a year, two years, five years. It's something that we can refer to a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I was going back through, um, it helps me to take notes during meetings because as we all, you know, we're all at home or, you know, it's late at night and then you forget some of the things. Christine at the planning board meeting had said as a final kind of comment at the end, perhaps this could be, this plan could be something that's adopted, attached to the master plan. So we put that as an action step because the common theme, especially from the municipal stakeholders was, was we need some type of guidance on how to make these decisions. So it's, if it's something that's formalized, I think that would be helpful. Visually formalized and, you know, not just, you all know what it means and we can Google what the standards are, but something that is part of the Amherst, you know, documentation. Um, one other um, thing that crossed my mind, I was um, really pleased to see the focus on um, expanding histories in terms of um, indigenous populations and African Americans. Um, and I don't, I, I, I have somewhere here a, a document on um, integrating um, LGBTQ, LGBTQ history. Um, that might be something if the commission feels like that's a good thing to add in terms of um, diversifying. I don't think that we've had that focus before to find. Yeah, there is mention in there at, because uh, Joe Hogopian, who is a planner here now, he had started to delve into that, just trying okay. to, um, trying to, and this is an interesting thing I threw in as an action step, which I'm curious of your yeah. thought, take on this. And we're hearing from a lot of communities, we need to have a broader history. We need to recognize all of our re residents, but as I was starting to do research on this, I realized that's kind of outside of the scope of this project um, because the reason we don't know is because it there's not a lot of documentation. So I threw in there an action step of pursuing 
a town history, updating the town history. That that could be a separate project for a historian. Um, when we do these types of projects, we're always looking at these histories that were written in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's kind of the primary resource right. for this, you know, the history, right. the history of an area. But um, there's the information is not in one place, so it might be a neat thing to to have that as an action step for the community to really formalize that process and write that history so that it's broader, which is what everybody seems to be looking for. And beyond the scope of your commission, <laughs> but could help to inform decisions that you have to make in your roles. Penny, you have a comment? Yeah, um, page 10, Shannon, um, and um, um, where you start the uh, MS community profile in historic context. Um, it's a bit of, it's nice that to get that sort of general paragraph going first and then you jump to European settlement. Could we please add a paragraph in between those two that talks about the indigenous landscape so that there isn't such a big kind of jump <laughs> in the sort of chronology and um, the sort of sense of inclusivity as well um, between that first and second paragraph. So that's page 10. Because sure. it exists when you get, not to not to plug a dead horse, but if, <laughs> if you go to the next page, it's all there. I, I think it's just nice to to say we're going to talk about this in, and here's, here's, here's sort of the the setup, you know, right from the beginning. That was that was the only thing that really stood out to me. I really love the plaque program idea, page forty-three, um, that we're going to do a nomination for the Mill River Trail corridor. Um, okay. I think I think I think you've identified some really good action steps. It's it's a little daunting, as a commissioner, <laughs> but I you know there's all this. You know, stuff to, to, to add. Well, I remember that uh, comment early on was, please don't give us things that we can't ever right. achieve. So okay. I, this, this, Ken and I are still working on this and we'll work on this with you, but um, we do this yeah. in our other plans too. We try to identify kind of the stakeholder, the group spearheading it, but there have to be partnerships involved in getting right. anything done. Right. So I try, you're, you won't be the lead on every idea. <laughs> it, it really made me think about what you say on page 46 about resiliency planning. What, what an interesting idea. I mean, I'm very late to the table on all of this, but that was a really great phrase, I think, to start to sort of think, well, what are our priorities? You know, and what, what, are, what does resiliency really mean there? Is it about staffing? Is it about um, climate? Oh, yeah. Is it, you know, what, yeah, whatever that's true. angle you you know, it it just seemed to me to be a byword to kind of hold everything together. To, to sort yeah, of think about well, that's I'm, I'm that's a good point about staffing thing. because it's not just the resi resiliency yeah. of the physical buildings, but it's also the capacity of the community to be able to support right. everything that you're trying to do. Um, resilience. I attended this COSTEP Mass, which you'll see referenced in here, coordinated statewide emergency planning. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Um, I apologize if you're hearing an echo. It's coming in and out of where I am. But it's they they work a lot with museums and libraries to try to think about their buildings. But they recently did a statewide cultural resource map, and they've put a lot of toolkits on their website to think about planning. Um, and one of the presenters was the curator of a historic property in Salem, and he talked about how he had just worked with the fire department, showed them where the important, maybe collection, most important area where collections were in their building. And they had that kind of conversation in advance when it wasn't an emergency. And then there was a fire. And because that was in the books, they knew, okay, we really, there's maps in there from the 1600s. <laughs> like we, so it's just to put that in a plan, I think is important for a community to then work with the building inspector, work with the local emergency responders, um, the planning department to think
think about this in advance. Okay, if we had, you know, a flood come through here or a tornado like in Munson, where or what? How could we move some of these collections to a more resilient area? So I'm glad that you like that because I think we're seeing every master plan we work on starts with a municipal vulnerability. What is that called, Ken? MVP. MVP. It's municipal vulner vulnerability preparedness. Hard to say that at eight o'clock at night, right? So yes. So resiliency has to be part of the conversation because months in with that tornado going right down their main street, um, it, it we want to have those conversations and thoughts before. Thanks, Hetty. Um, Michaela, comment. Um, I guess my Any comment is a lot more. Um, not about the content, but more about the formatting, the community feedback survey that starts on page 31. There's some like repeated um, answers on different charts, but like the color and order of the answers is not consistent. So it was really confusing okay. for me um, <laughs> to understand what people were saying because the colors are not correlated to each other on each chart. Okay. So, okay, that's helpful. And the, um, some of the comments that I put in the appendices, we don't have to have them all in there, but I wanted you to see the broad range of write-in responses. That was more towards the end. I did a lot of quotes of people, you know, do you have any other comments? People had a lot of comments. You had a very, there was only, we had 124 responses for this survey, um, but the people who responded, they really, you know, put thought into what they were, they were writing. So if you haven't had a look at that, that's there for your, your viewing pleasure. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, when, when this is finalized, I like the idea of having the appendices as one document and then the plan as one, but then also having having them combined and we could have it all online, but um, you know, it, just so someone doesn't um, think it's, they have to read a hundred and plus whatever, how many pages it's being, it's just, yep. you know, but I think right. having the appendices, I like having, you know, having it both ways. Um, and I'll also in the um, table of contents, it'll be linked so it can jump to those sections. Yeah, so when the planning board had this discussion, it was it was a while ago. It was interesting. A lot of members were, were um, talked about you know the preservation of the built form, right? Um, what was happening tonight with the demolition review, and maybe the settlement patterns. The village center is an open space, uh, but you know I do think that if preservation can be broader. And so, uh, you know, we've been looking at different members for to fill vacancies for different commissions, and you know I think making history accessible is really relevant today. And so, you know, I think some of the programs we're trying to do and what um, the plan has is really important. So, uh, you know, I feel like uh, education can be preservation and, you know, and it's still something that we have, we struggle with, you know, how do you educate the public? How do you make things more kind of relevant and, um, you know, accessible? And so it's saying, I, to me, I also help with housing, right? Affordable housing, it's the same kind of thing you know, when it's in your backyard, you might talk about it, but in general, people might not, they might say they support a ho affordable housing, but when it really matters there, maybe there's a lot of questions or mm -hmm. comments or concerns. And so, you know, I, I like, you know, I'd like to be able to have this plan and put it online. I, mean, I think adopting it through the master plan is great. Um, you know, I'd like to take some of these action steps That's and say, how can this be folded into any budgetary process with the town or capital mm -hmm. uh, things and really try to, especially because it's newer, right? I think it's really, it'll be really relevant and how can we keep furthering it uh, after it's done? So I, I like, you know, I like, I like the way it's structured and I like what we can take from it, how we can. Do. Great, thank you. You have a lot of good quotes. Making history accessible is relevant today. Education <laughs> can be preservation. I bolded that one. <laughs> thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah, the former chair used to say that all the time. You know, um, um, you, you know, you scan a page or two out of certain books and email the commission, and it's like it, you know, yeah. like the barometer. Yeah, well, that board. that was the message from everybody we spoke with was we, they're trying to understand yeah. 
what's the process? What are we looking for? What, and something you said tonight earlier about um, the press, what is the commission's designation of preferably preserved? Um, what did somebody, somebody in one of the things said, this is very industry specific language. And I remember attending a, some preservation mass conference a few years ago and they were like, you have to, you can't like speak preservation talk because you're going to lose people. So it is a fine line of um, not talking, you're not talking over people's heads because these are all terms that we have to use when we're assessing things. But um, that, that meeting in the middle where it, you're making it more of, it's a, it's a community benefit um, to save these buildings. It's not just this small group of people who don't want anything to change. So trying to find the strike the balance, but making it a conversation instead of talking at people. That's the goal of this plan. <laughs> Next time you see it, it's going to be just right. And um, what is the timeline rate in Shannon? So we've extended, we just sent the amendment. Um, Nate just got that like just a few hours ago. We've extended the end date to December 31st. And I think we've done the full outreach process and reached different groups that we feel comfortable with what we're recommending. Um, I'm hoping I would like to give you the next draft with your comments and the rest of the missing information before your November meeting. Although do your meetings kind of float? Would that, would that be about four weeks from now or? Do we have it in the calendar, Nate? I don't think we have November. So I'd like, you know, about four weeks from now to give you the revised version with your edits after you've had a chance to track changes in a document. And then we'd like to then take that version and, and ideally have the final version by mid-December and give it a little bit of time and space so that whoever else you want to look at it um, can make comments. I'm sorry. Antonia, did you have a question? Yeah, it was just a comment um, on the history um, aspect of it. Um, I was wondering, I mean, obviously it's a non-finished draft, but I was wondering if there is information about like the names of uh, some of the enslaved um, members of the Amherst community, whether that would be included um, just because other names okay. were. Um, and then I was wondering um, if in your like, research or compilation of research, whether there was anything about like the proximity of Amherst or the, the inclusion of it in the Underground Railroad. Cause I know like Northampton and Florence had large um, like aspects in the Underground Railroad. So I was wondering if that would be something that um, you looked into um, for Amherst's history. So oh, thank you for those questions. So. We did include some of what we found about the, and I'm, I'm still now trying to figure out because as I'm researching more, African-American has shifted towards the black indigenous people of color and trying to decide, this is when I started realizing this is so much bigger than this project, trying to fill in these holes, but then also explain the entire history of, yeah, of Amherst. So my goal is to get as much information as we can, can that's missing, but also make recommendations for what could be further researched. And that's my pie in the sky idea of why not um, fund somebody writing a proper history and filling in those blanks as much as possible. Thank you. And the, the Underground Railroad piece, I'm I haven't come across that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. I know the Mass Historical Commission did a related resources type um, documentation, but there's not a lot of buildings that they, they finished all the way, um, confirming that they were. I know we have one in Springfield, for example, that was supposedly part of the National, of the Underground Railroad, but it's not documented that way. It's just kind of local lore. So that would be something that we could point out to do research if that was something that happened in Amherst. Um, Shannon, when would you like our um, tracked changes by? Give us a deadline. A deadline. Um, Give us a date. Yeah, I'd say. So today is the 12th. Well, I'll email this to Nate, but I, I'll give you, you know, a week, week and a half, two weeks. It would be great to have something towards the end of the month so that Ken and I can mm -hmm. then finish. And in the meantime, I'll, I'll keep filling in. Yeah. The missing sections but 
Okay. I'd say comfortably, you know, by the end of the month, but the sooner you get it to us, the sooner we can work towards finalizing the next draft. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to propose the next meeting be the, you know, around the 16th. The, the Housing Trust typically meets the second Thursday of the month. I also work with them, but I've missed their meetings the last few months. Um, so if we could have it, you know, that week, even the week of um, November 13th. So it could be Monday, you know, Monday's the 13th. So anytime that week. Um, and that's, you know, I, I would do that for two reasons. One, um, it could give us time for this, for the draft and, you know, for commission to make me commission members to make comments and then for PBPC to incorporate them. And also if there's a demolition hearing, uh, there may be an application that would give us enough time to then also have a hearing and try to combine it with meetings and not have two meetings, you know, within the same week or something. Uh, that sounds good. Um, with the caveat that if my daughter's in a state divisional soccer game, I will not be here. <laughs> <laughs> but you will have the draft one way or another. But I think that that's going to be um, soccer playoffs. And her team's currently ranked first. So do you have any questions for Ken or any comments related to the municipal section? That was a new uh, kind of a more recent addition to this draft. Yeah, I think um, just to add to Shannon's comments um, and Nate, you know, kind of uh, summarized the conversations that we've had with the planning board. A lot of my work at PVPC is um, regulatory, looking at zoning and uh, mostly land use type um, things. And, um, you know, having worked in many communities and how to address historical resources um, has been something that um, communities are all on different pages. And so um, it was fascinating getting to read and do some additional research on this, knowing that I think for the most part I, of the communities that I've ever worked in, Amherst is probably the most robust of trying to figuring out, um, you know, what types of protections there can be under land use regulations, but also ensuring that your municipal processes are doing its, you know, it has the, the best impact. So, you know, I'm, I look forward to the comments from the, the commission as to, you know, if those things um, are helpful. I think also comments from the from Nate, um, you know, if um, there, there may be things to look at more closely um, for the for that particular section, um, you know, something that we can make a little um, add some more to. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, the planning board is looking at rezoning different areas, uh, village centers for density, maybe doing yep. an over, overlay on University Drive to allow for denser housing. And I think, you know, what what it looks like is really important. So we're, we're also have a request for proposals out to have a consultant come up with um, design standards for the downtown and village centers, folks in the downtown. Uh, I think the commission can be a part of that. Um, so, you know, what Ken said is is interesting to me is that you know, we could try to have the commission, you know, think about what could zoning help with preservation. And so, you know, it's not just the, you know, um, you know, a delay or preferably preserved. It could be, you know, are there setbacks or other pieces that, you know, whether or not the commission researches it, maybe it's something that we recommend to the planning board that, you know, there's certain aspects of, you know, what they control with zoning that could be important for preservation. And oftentimes I feel like those pieces aren't really connected. Very well and so it's nice to see that um you know i don't have anything specific but you know we have design guidelines downtown now that are uh, advisory and we're trying to make those a little bit more um have a little more teeth and so i think it can go along with this plan in terms of what you know what's important is it yeah you know, a lot of the comments were about, about scale, scale and you know that feeling of and i think that design community-wide design guidelines would be helpful um, for anyone. I also was curious if you noticed our, we threw in a um, minimum building, it's known as uh, demolition by neglect, but minimum building exterior standards. And we were looking at your bylaws and there's the nuisance bylaw, which has been getting stronger, um, which even relates to stuff on the sidewalk. And we were like, huh. So that's, that's something, that's something that, that we'd like you to take a look at um, because it was coming up in conversations with 
your commission about absentee landlords and letting buildings, it, that's a kind of a different way to approach not creating a local historic district, but just um, saying, okay, we have, we expect you to keep up your building and, you know, design guidelines, there's different tools and things, but we linked some case studies uh, that we thought were interesting examples. And also the certified local government is something else we'd like you to take a look at because Amherst would be a good candidate for that and also could open the way to more funding and support from the National Park Service and Mass Historical Commission. And then that's on page 55 right yeah yes yep 50 56 I believe in the okay yep and the, there's a narrative within the body but yep the action plan Community design guidelines, certified local government status, that is. Oh, yeah. community minimum building exterior standards um, were some of the things we, we thought might be interesting, interesting to, talk, to about. talk about. And like you said, different approach. approach. Wow. I think I'm going to run. I'm sorry, but I have to. I'm, I'm going to run. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just mute myself and turn my screen off in case I come back. But uh, Robin, I've made you the host. And so. Okay. Um, don't really know what I'm doing, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. Thanks, Nate. So I will link up with Nate and get a, um, what did he say? One, I forget what the, sh I know that some organizations aren't using Dropbox anymore, but we will figure out how to I'm share something. the word version. Yeah. Drive. Yeah. OneDrive. OneDrive. Something. OneDrive. Something. Yeah. OneDrive. We'll link up so that you can get the word version and then track changes. Okay, that'll be really helpful. I and then the, have the goal will be towards the end of the month um, to to get your comments, and then we'll incorporate that along with what we're adding to it. Okay. And Shannon, a question: um, We've been working on these plans kind of for other communities. So I know that we've had a really long delay between when our last preservation plan was uh, put together and this one. Um, this update, um, what are communities, I, MHC recommends what, like every five years, like what's a realistic no, standard for it, how Yes, but you're good. Most communities don't have a preservation plan okay. at all. Like Amherst just is just doing theirs right now, right, Ken? Not Amherst, Northampton, I'm sorry. See this, right. I'm normally asleep at this time, so I apologize. Northampton is doing their first, I mean, they have design guidelines for the district, but they are doing their first community-wide historic preservation plan. So Amherst is like, like as, as Ken said, you're, you're, it's a pleasure to do this because you've already done so many steps continuously over decades of, you know, understanding what is important to the community and, and then working towards those goals. So I think it's 10 years, I'm not sure. Okay. What's the state okay. preservation plan? They yeah, just, just updated it. Maybe that was five years, but yeah, you're, you're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, it's good to, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, as we get this yeah. one under our belts to keep, to not lose track of when it actually yeah. starts. And I out. think that the, yeah. the 2005 plan, did it say 10 years, I believe was the recommendation. So that would have been 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it could be 10 years, Okay, I think would be safe, but right, right. that's, I'm going to put that in there. That, that should be an action step. Any other comments, anybody? All right. Anything else from you, Shannon or Ken? Okay. Thank you, Thank you for inviting us to your meeting. Appreciate Thank you reading Thank through you. this giant document. So much. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a Bye. good night. Thank okay. you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Okay. Um. So the remainder of our uh, public meeting items, um, other than public comment, um, are all uh, old business, uh, which um, from my perspective, I don't think anyone, I, I certainly haven't made any progress on, and um, I'm not sure if anybody else has. I was just gonna suggest that we table them to the next meeting um, when okay. we can hopefully get some movement there. Um, if anybody has any questions on them, they were, uh, we've been trying to develop uh, um, commission one and five year commission goals. Um, we have this historic barns and outbuilding assessment pilot program that's got funding now from the CPA, and we need to get word out to our property owners about that. 
um, the policy for preservation restrictions uh, really requires Nate to be in on that discussion. Same for National Register nominations, documentation of 140 Southeast Street. Um, so those are all items that I think we're just gonna move to the next meeting unless there's any objection. Yeah. No. Okay. I don't know the exact technical language I'm supposed to use, but, um, and at this point, uh, we, the next agenda item would be public comment. Um, I see that Hilda Greenbaum is in the attendees. Um, if Hilda wanted to make public comment at this point, she could raise her hand and I can see if I could figure out how to let her into the meeting. <laughs> There's her hand. Um, oh, look, there's a very handy button that says allowed to talk. <laughs> Uh, okay. Hello, Hilda. You're currently I, muted. No, I'm just trying to write this up for the end date. I have sure. nothing to say. Oh, you have nothing to say? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's well, a very rare occasion, so <laughs> I say for it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Hilda. Um, so... Uh, since there's no further public comment, um, the only, let's see, uh, unanticipated items. Anyone have any unanticipated items? No, okay. Robin, can you just confirm the next meeting, our next so meeting? Have, yeah, we have um, a meeting next week, uh, the 19th, <laughs> and that's to deal with the, the Jones Library. That's specifically for the Jones Library um, preservation restriction. <laughs> issue and Nate will be getting us more information for that. And then in terms of our November meeting and the week of November 13th, I will, when we get off here, I will send out um, a doodle poll or a doodle-like poll um, for those evenings uh, to see which, um, which day works best for everybody, including Nate. And then um, we'll forward that to you guys by email to let you know the next, the, the following meeting, the November meeting. Um, so with that, I think I don't need to have a vote to adjourn unless anybody has another comment. No, okay. okay. Thanks, Thanks Thank everybody, you, everybody for being here. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. It's at 8.17. Bye guys. Okay. Mm -hmm.